So I'd like to speak a few words about uh, the William Sloan Coffin Jr. Award before giving, uh, giving it to Jeremy. William Sloan Coffin Jr. was a brilliant scholar, a superb athlete, and a gifted pianist, but he was of the most, one of the most publicly engaged and committed world citizens of the 20th century. And rather than turn a blind eye to the 1953 CIA coup in Iran, he resigned his post as a CIA officer and devoted himself to the ministry. He stepped outside the comfort zone and he became an unrelenting public opponent of segregation, gender discrimination, and illegitimate political and military authority. As president of Sane Freeze, which became uh, Peace Action, and Peace Action New York State is an affiliate of Peace Action, he, he kept alive the vision of a world without nuclear weapons, which is one of our missions we continue. And in his honor, we confer this award to an individual who's dedicated their skills and profession to peace. Jeremy Scahill, a brave war correspondent and a brilliant investigative journalist. To me, he's a human rights hero because he pursues relentlessly the truth and exposes the truth so that we all have the information we need to know the truth and to take action. Amy Goodman is going to come up and speak a few words about uh, Jeremy, and then we'll have an interview between Amy and Jeremy. So for now, before we do that, I'd like to confer the William Sloan Coffin Jr. Award to Jeremy Scahill. It's my great honor. Brilliant speech. Thank you so much. Well, I can say that uh, Peace Action is absolutely very, very fortunate to have uh, leadership like Liz's, and um, I think. I think she's going to be a very, very exciting leader, and uh, at a time when we absolutely need leaders for peace. Uh, and that, that experience that she was describing um, in The Hague is, is so important on a number of levels. Um, but the level on which it may be most important, as Liz takes the helm of the leadership here, uh, is that the same standard that has been applied in an ad hoc way uh, to countries like the former Yugoslavia, uh, to countries like Rwanda, um, has no actual meaning unless that same standard is applied to the United States and powerful countries around the world. You know, I think, I think all of us have been struggling to some extent to, to figure out what is the, the moral position on, on Syria. Um, in, a, in a sea of very, very bad actors and, and criminals, it's difficult to figure out uh, who to support or who to be behind. And, um, you know, I was asked once about what I thought of Bashar al-Assad, and I, I said that I thought that Assad was a war criminal who should be tried and uh, uh, prosecuted at The Hague, uh, but not unless Donald Rumsfeld is in the courtroom next to him. <laughs> Uh, 
You know, I remember the, the great, uh, well, I don't remember because he, he died before I was born, but I, I, I recall reading um, many of the writings of the, the great uh, Trappist monk Thomas Merton. And he was one of the early faith-based voices to come out against the war in Vietnam. And he actually died under very mysterious circumstances. He was abroad and, and uh, he, he died in a, uh, in a bathtub. Um, he was electrocuted by a fan or another electrical device that had gone in and then his body was actually flown back to the United States on a CIA plane. Um, but he wasn't, a, he wasn't some sort of an in the streets revolutionary. Um, he was a contemplative, thoughtful person who saw way ahead of the, of the game that was being played by world powers in Vietnam. And his writings predated the secular American left's opposition to the war in Vietnam, to the Catholic left's opposition to the war in Vietnam. And, and when he was asked, um, whose side are you on in Vietnam? Are you on the side of the North Vietnamese, the Viet Cong? Uh, who are the good guys here? He said, I'm, I'm on the side of the people that are being burned, which is, if you think about it, an, an incredible moral position to take with huge consequences for the life of the person that says that, meaning you've, you've now staked out a moral position uh, where you're going to be on the side of, of the people that are being killed or targeted regardless of uh, what political ideology they have, uh, but because of the humanity that they have and their right to not be burned. And of course, it was, it was also somewhat prophetic when he was asked that because it was around the time when the United States started using Agent Orange. Um, in Vietnam, which of course literally was burning people alive. And, uh, and, and I, I was thinking today, reflecting on, on what to say in, in accepting this award. I mean, I, I don't believe I deserve this award. Um, and it, it's not, I'm not trying to be, uh, to have some sense of false humility, but I just, I know so many people whose entire lives are dedicated to justice who are in the streets when they're being ridiculed and there's five of them on a corner in front of a, federal, front of a federal building in some Midwestern town somewhere. And I, I think those are the real heroes in our society, the people that just never give up. And um, you know, I, I had the honor of living with, uh, with the late Philip Berrigan uh, at Jonah House in Baltimore uh, for a year. And much of what I did there was paint houses with Phil Berrigan, and, and you know, I, I often think that you know, there are three people responsible for me becoming a journalist. Um, one is Phil Berrigan, the other is David Dellinger, and the third is Amy Goodman. And um, you know, one thing that, uh, that Phil Berrigan uh, really drilled into my head is that the point of activism is not winning. The point of activism is not whether other people think you're effective. Those are, those are great qualities to have in movements. We do actually want to win victories, and, and we do win victories. I, I believe that the peace movement in this country, um, allied in a very strange way with libertarians, did stop uh, the president's uh, desire to bomb Syria some months ago. I think that was largely in response to the fact that there was that kind of pushback. We'll never be able to prove that. We don't know that. Um, so you can, you can have things like that, which I guess you could, you could call victories, but uh, you know, Phil Berrigan told me this great story, and I always remember it, um, about a, um, an anarchist named uh, Ammon Hennessy, who was a World War I draft resistor, and then he spent much of his lifetime living in voluntary poverty uh, with the Catholic Worker Movement and other community movements, and he was protesting in front of the White House against World War I. And a reporter came up to him and said, you know, Mr. Hennessy, uh, you, can, you can march out here all you want with your poster, but you're not going to change their minds. And he said, you may be right, but they sure as hell aren't going to change mine. Um, and I think somewhere between that mentality and strategic thinking, because I ultimately do think that the core issues that Peace Action organizes around, if all of the facts were made available uh, to people across this country and across the world, I don't think any reasonable person who views themselves as a humanist or views themselves as a, simply as a human 
would say, oh no, I actually think that, that, uh, that uh, the United States possessing an infinite number of nuclear weapons, I think that's a great idea. I think, I think Israel having nuclear weapons and, and being a client state of the United States, I, I think that, that really does make sense for our security. It doesn't. You could make the efficacy argument on our foreign policy uh, without even raising any moral issues whatsoever to say that it makes us less safe. Um, to, to me, we could win that debate if it's, a, if it's a level playing field and it's a fair debate. But so often, the, the people who are invited onto these television shows at times of war are the people who have PhDs in being wrong. And it is the same recycled bunch of uh, war criminals or armchair would-be war criminals because they don't actually want to go and fight themselves. They want other people to fight or they want other people's children to fight. I mean, I basically just view the Sunday talk shows now as a, uh, as a sort of lottery of who's wrong, you know, and, and you could just draw, pick it pick from having, John, John McCain is on those shows more than anyone. And John McCain has just been dead wrong on all of these policies for so long, and he just doubles down on being wrong, and somehow the bookers just love to put him there. Um, I, uh, uh, I, a few years ago, I was in, um, uh, I was in the Washington, D.C. area, um, around um, the Thanksgiving holiday, and I was um, walking uh, with some people uh, near, uh, near the river, and uh, it was a it was beautiful fall day, and uh, you know, we were just chatting, and, and it was a nice leisurely walk, and there were about a half a dozen of us, and I see walking toward me what appears to be Paul Wolfowitz. And, uh, and of course, Paul Wolfowitz was one of the main architects of the invasion of Iraq. He is a diehard neoconservative. He was the man who went in front of the Congress and said that this whole thing is going to get paid for by the oil revenue that we are going to uh, profit from uh, in Iraq after we remove Saddam Hussein from power and put in our own neoliberal government. Um, and, I, and, and so here I am actually confronted with Paul Wolfowitz walking toward me on a beautiful fall day. And I'm not working, you know, I wasn't, you know, I'm not, wasn't doing any reporting. I was actually just, you know, just chilling. And uh, so he walks by and I had like this visceral reaction as he's passing and he kind of, we look at each other and I said, he, you're a war criminal. Just, just like that. <laughs> you're a, and and I, I had this sensation where it's, it must be what it's like if you see someone snatch a purse on the street where you're like, stop, criminal. So I, I like had like an out-of-body experience. I didn't exactly remember everything that I did. People filled me in on it later, but I remember the core parts of it. But I, I said, you're, you are a war criminal. And then I start yelling as he's scurrying away, Paul Wolfowitz is a war criminal. And I'm, so ch chasing, you know, he's, he's like literally kind of fleeing. And he was with his new mistress that he had just been outed as seeing when he had been moved from the world. But I don't care what he, who these people, what they're doing in private. I care what they're doing in public. But I just think it was amazing that these two were just like shuffling away. And, and there's all this, this coverage of, of, of his mistress and no coverage of the fact that this guy is actually uh, a war criminal. And, um, and I, I, I'm sure that, uh, you know, many of you in this room are familiar with the former CIA analyst Ray McGovern who is an incredible uh, peace activist. And he spent 27 years in the CIA. He was George H.W. Bush's uh, national security briefer, would prepare the presidential, participate in preparing the presidential daily briefing, the, the single most important intelligence document produced in the country on any given day except Democracy Now's show. And, um, and, but, but Ray McGovern and, and Colonel Ann Wright like him, uh, who was in the military for several decades and then reopened the U.S. Embassy in Kabul after 9-11 and then resigned in protest over what she saw as a disastrous war that would bring blowback. Those two have spent their lives uh, since they left uh, the CIA and the military respectively disrupting the speeches of powerful people and, 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 and sometimes being uh, tackled or punched or beaten and thrown out. And they, they do it every chance they get to the point where the Secret Service had sent out a warning note uh, to um, the presidential detail that if they ever see Ray McGovern, who is a former CIA official who has all these pictures of him in the bushes and commendations from the bushes, that if he comes anywhere near the president that they are to prevent him from having any access to a location where the president is going to be. That's how afraid they are of this nonviolent former CIA officer who has pictures on his wall with George H.W. Bush, the Reagans, and others. Why is it that he's such a threat to them now? 
He's a threat because he's been on the inside, he knows the deal, and he has dedicated his life to speaking out about it. And Ray McGovern is a member of Peace Action in the uh, D.C. area. Um, I mentioned before that Dave Dellinger was one of the uh, three people that was responsible for me becoming a, a journalist. And um, it's, it's interesting because a lot, of, uh, um, a lot of young people have no idea who David Dellinger was. Um, I grew up in a household where my, my father had been at the Catholic Worker in the late 60s, early 70s. He lived with Dorothy Day on the Lower East Side here and went to Cuba on the 2nd Vence Ramos Brigade. And so I grew up in a household where th there were all these books around from the, you know, from the 60s and 70s written by various peace activists, uh, the theologian William Stringfellow, for instance. And I never paid any attention to these books until, because my, you know, my dad was, he would try to get us to read these things and we never would. And I remember coming home you know, one day after school and kind of picking around and I saw, I had just started reading the autobiography of Malcolm X and was sort of understanding, I was in high school, I was sort of understanding uh, what the word revolution meant for the first time. And I saw this book called Revolutionary Nonviolence. And I thought, wow, that's a, that's a striking title. And I start reading. And what it was, it was the essays of this incredible man, David Dellinger, um, beginning with his refusal uh, to uh, fight in, uh, in U.S. wars. And he, his autobiography was called From Yale to Jail uh, because he uh, came from a very elite, wealthy family and went to an Ivy League school, and instead of becoming an investment banker or a, pol a politician, um, he dedicated his entire life to a great mixture of activism and journalism. And, uh, and one of the early essays in that book was about his decision to go uh, and participate alongside the Abraham Lincoln Brigades in the Franco Rebellion, uh, where um, international leftist movements um, came to Spain uh, before the, the ultimate rise of Hitler and fascism in Europe. And they came to fight against fascism in Spain because they viewed uh, that as the, the place where it could be stopped. And if it wasn't stopped there, that it was going to spread throughout Europe. And, and they were right. And the United States was on the wrong side of, of that war from the very beginning. Dave Dellinger there didn't go there, though, to, to, to take up arms. He went there as a committed, dedicated, uh, pacifist. And he had a belief uh, that pacifism cannot mean that you just condemn the violence of others, particularly a violence that is revolutionary in nature and is aimed at trying to bring down a regime supported by a government you have an obligation to try to confront if you come from the heart of the empire. And that if you believe that people, for instance, in Cuba didn't have a right to overthrow Fulgencio Batista through arms, then as a pacifist, you should get your ass down to Cuba and show them how to nonviolently overthrow Fulgencia Batista's regime. And it was, it, was, it was a remarkably sophisticated, complicated analysis that is so seldom discussed in this society when people say, well, what's your answer? David Dellinger's answer during Vietnam was to go to, the, to North Vietnam and meet with Ho Chi Minh. And while he was meeting with Ho Chi Minh, he condemned Ho Chi Minh's crimes against American soldiers. At the same time, he condemned the American war. And he, released, he negotiated the release of American POWs. And, and he did there, and he spoke truth to power of, of Ho Chi Minh's government, but ultimately of the government of the country where he was from, the United States. He had a moral consistency and had the bravery to go there and put his own life at risk for his principle, which at that time was pacifism. He got a lot of heat for the uh, stances that he took on Cuba, for the stance that he took on Vietnam. And as I read this book, which spans his entire life all the way through the 1970s and the women's liberation uh, movement, you realize that there's this remarkable American that almost no one in this era has ever heard of. And, and I met him in, in, toward the end of his life, and we became very close, and I met him because we both were in Washington, D.C. in 1995. I wasn't a journalist yet. I had never heard of Amy Goodman. Um, I went to a, a, a conference about political prisoners. And I, uh, I met William Kunstler, the amazing uh, civil rights, human rights lawyer, who also is no longer with us. And it was a conference that was talking about uh, not only Mumia Abu-Jamal, but Leonard Peltier, who is a Native American that has been in prison for decades on what, what I believe are totally false 
allegations that he killed two FBI agents. And, and I had read so much about that case, and I, I, I was thinking of sort of dedicating my short-term time in life, because I wasn't sure what I was going to do, to fighting for Leonard Peltier's release. And David Dellinger had already stated publicly that that was his primary commitment in life, was to free uh, Leonard Peltier, because he felt that, that Native people in this country uh, have gotten the rawest of the raw deal here, but also that no one, even in the broader left, was paying attention to Leonard Peltier. And so we, I started working with him on the, on the committee to free Leonard Peltier. One of the things that we did was we, we drafted a petition that we wanted to deliver to Attorney General Janet Reno at the time. This was when President Clinton was in office. And so David Dellinger, myself, and a couple of other people, we didn't, we weren't carrying signs, uh, you know, you know, no banners, we weren't chanting, we were not going to commit civil disobedience. We went to the Justice Department with this petition that we wanted to uh, deliver to the Attorney General Janet Reno, uh, presenting her with evidence that was not included in the trial of Leonard Peltier. And we had gotten this stuff not from the internet, because it basically didn't exist then, but from the defense team that said we've been trying to get this into court. So we went there to go and do this. The moment that we walked into the Justice Department, one of the security people recognized David Dellinger and said, yo, no, no, you guys are not coming in here. And at that time, this is pre-9-11, it was very different. You could just sort of walk into the building. Yeah, you had to go through a metal detector, but you could enter those buildings. And, and David Dellinger said, I wasn't aware that there was a law that David Dellinger isn't allowed to come into the Justice Department. And they said, well, no, we know what you're going to do here. And he said, well, why do you know what I'm going to do here? What we're going to do here is deliver this petition to Janet Reno. You have heard of petitioning against grievances. Well, that's what we're, we're doing. And they said, no, 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 you're not allowed in here. And they said, everyone with you has to leave the building. And so they start just pushing us out. And they push us out. And, um, and Dellinger says, you know, fuck this. We're sitting. He had a totally filthy mouth, um, <laughs> as do I. And he says, you know, we're, we're going to sit in front of the Justice Department doors. So, so I'm like, all right, well, I guess this guy's a legendary activist. I guess it's fine if we sit in front of the Justice Department doors. So we sit down in front of the Justice Department doors. And they go and they shut this huge metal thing, like something from the Wizard of Oz just comes like, boom. They shut the Justice Department down because four or five people were sitting in front of the, the door. And then they come out. They give us like one warning to leave. And then they arrest all of us. And, um, and this brings me to the Amy Goodman part of the story. <laughs> So around this time, I had started stalking Amy Goodman, not in a creepy, you know, restraining order way, but in a, you know, I, I really love what you do. And, and you know, a, there's, a whole other, there's a whole other side of this that I'm sure Amy will, will mention. But the short of it is that finally Amy had agreed to let me volunteer on, on, on what at the time was a, a very small but great radio show, Democracy Now! It had just gotten thrown off of every single station in the state of Pennsylvania for airing the prison commentaries of Mumia Abu Jamal, which NPR refused to air. And then Democracy Now! said, well, we'll work with the Prison Radio Project and we will, we will do this. So I was just coming around sort of Amy Goodman and I, I, I didn't want to tell her um, I have a court date um, in Washington, D.C. because I really wanted like, her to hire me. So like, I, I, you know, the, my, I know my court date is getting closer. I'm, I have this like, National Lawyers Guild guy who's representing me in D.C. and I'm calling him and I'm saying, you know, is there any way that this can be resolved? So no, the government is taking this to, to court. I said, well, could I, is there a fine I could pay? Nope, you got to come down for this, tri for, this, for this hearing. And so I finally had the cop to it and tell Amy that I had like this you know, criminal charge pending against me. And Amy actually went with me then to the trial. And I said that I was going to represent my, uh, myself. And, um, and they, they forced uh, an attorney onto me who actually was kind of an amazing uh, guy who was an immigrant from India. And, um, and I met with him for like 10 minutes. And he said, well, I'll, I'll, I'll let you handle it. All I'll do is I'll just examine you when you're on the stand. And, uh, and so I presented my own opening statement. I cross-examined the, the government witnesses. I cross-examined the police officers who were there. And they said all sorts of contradictory things. And I had never seen an episode of Law and Order. I was just going like, you know, common sense sort of stuff. And, um, and anyway, long story short is, uh, is I won. And I was acquitted representing myself. And, and the... Uh, the prosecutor who was there was a was a uh, he was a naval officer who was now in the naval reserves. It was a prosecutor, and he had all he was so he hated anti-war people. He hated social justice people. He looked astonished when the judge said not guilty, and uh, and he throws his papers and then storms out of the courtroom. So I considered that my first victory against the U.S. military was to get this guy. Um, but anyway, that's. 
and it wasn't too long ago, too long after that, that um, uh, Amy Goodman and I were covering an anti-nuclear protest at Andrews Air Force Base. Uh, it was in 1998. And uh, some plowshares activists hammered on an airplane, and they poured blood on an airplane. And uh, two of them, I believe, were, uh, were nuns over the age of 60. And, um, and Air Force security just descended on, oh, one of them was a, he's now um, not a priest anymore, but Father Frank Cordero, who's a sort of well-known peace activist in the Midwest, was also one of the, the people. And, uh, and the Air Force security came out, and it was just brutal. They just tackled these senior citizens, and um, a, a priest and two nuns and one layperson, and they just, they slammed them to the concrete and blah, blah, blah. And Amy and I had press passes on. Um, at the time, WBA, I didn't really have like official looking press passes, so we would always kind of get them from the United Nations. We would come up with a reason why we were covering the UN, and they looked very official, and they had your picture on them. So we had these United Nations press passes. And remember, this is the era of militias and black helicopter theories and all that stuff. The UN is going to take over the world, which is, if only. Um, and, uh, and so Amy and I are there, and she, you know, we're both recording. I'm in one place, Amy's in another, and, and they, they start to notice us, and they're looking at our press passes, and they see that they're United Nations. So they radio in. There's also some people from the United Nations here, <laughs> as though we're like scary, you know, Boutros Boutros Ghali's paramilitaries have descended upon the president's aircraft at Andrews, and they tackle me and Amy and just shove, you know, our heads to the ground, and then they held us for hours, and they interrogated us, and they confiscated our tapes, and they were trying to figure out like, what to do with us. They held us in isolation from each other, and they were asking us all these questions, and the FBI came in. And, uh, and what ended up happening is that they, they ultimately decided that they, they had to let us go, um, and, uh, but not without a present. They, the present that they gave us was a letter saying that uh, both of us would have a lifetime ban from ever entering military property in the United States. <laughs> Um, and uh, I, I mind you, this is like my first couple months working with Amy Goodman, and I'm like, wow, I, I got acquitted of a criminal thing. I defended myself. Uh, they think I work for the United Nations. A Amy Goodman and I get interrogated by the FBI. Like, wow, what a what a bright future I must have. My parents are just gonna love this. Um, and so, well, so then we, we, we worked with Michael Ratner uh, from the Center for Constitutional Rights and, and Pacifica's lawyer, and, and we threatened to sue them. And then we, and I still have this letter, we eventually received a letter from uh, the commander of Andrews Air Force Base uh, saying that they had rescinded our lifetime ban and that we can actually enter military <laughs> property. I don't know that I've been on any military property since, but nor do I want to necessarily, but, uh, but we did win that small victory. Um, is that for me? <laughs> uh, I've been talking for a very long time, but there were so many things I, I, I wanted to say. I'll just run through them quickly because I think we're actually, we're living at a, at, a, at a moment, and I said this on Democracy Now! the other day, which I think there's an unprecedented threat to media freedom around the world and to um, journalists in particular. Um, you know, everyone, uh, you know, I'm sure, read the stories. Maybe some of you watched some of the videos that there are journalists that are um, being beheaded um, by ISIS. And, and that's gotten a lot of, of media coverage. And uh, you know, I, I knew James Foley, and uh, and I, I I find I find it just absolutely sickening. Um, at the same time, the majority of journalists that are being killed around the world are not being killed by groups like ISIS. They're being killed in nation by nation state actors, um, or by gangs connected to nation state actors. You have journalists being assassinated in Mexico, not only by narco cartels, but also by paramilitary forces allied with the Mexican government. Uh, in Colombia, a very similar scenario plays out. Somalia, record numbers of journalists are being killed by thugs and gangsters, some of whom are backed by the CIA. Um, in Syria, in, in, in Iraq, the vast majority of the journalists that, are, that have been kidnapped, the vast majority of the journalists that have been killed are not white American journalists. And their stories never get told uh, in, in the media in this country or in many so-called Western countries. The greatest risks being taken in the world right now by journalists are those being taken by unfamous journalists who are largely reporting not in the English language and who are uh, most responsible for any real information that we get um, out of many of these countries because they're able to embed in, in, in ver with various factions. They have local sources on the ground. They can follow. Uh, not only the media coverage, but they can get into chat rooms that a lot of Western journalists wouldn't know about. And they're such a vital resource to journalism, and they are being targeted 
and killed, and no one is saying anything about it. And then here in this country, uh, there's a war on journalism that is, uh, has been um, stamped with the uh, seal of legitimacy by a constitutional law professor who won the Nobel Peace Prize and is allowing his Justice Department to target whistleblowers in an unprecedented manner. Uh, the Espionage Act being applied to uh, individuals who work within the government of the military that are providing journalists with information that the government doesn't want out are now being accused officially in court of espionage. And, and one of the things that I find in a sea of, of injustice on this issue, but one of the things I find uh, most outrageous is that uh, people like uh, Edward Snowden are in uh, exile in Moscow. Chelsea Manning is doing a 30-year uh, prison sentence um, for the WikiLeaks cables. John Kiriakou, who spoke publicly about CIA waterboarding as a former CIA officer himself, is in federal prison right now. And Donald Rumsfeld is on a book tour. And Jose Rodriguez, the architect of the CIA's torture program, who bragged openly about creating the CIA black site network after 9-11, is on a book tour. You, you can tell a lot in this country by which uh, former government officials are in prison and which are on book tour. Um, and and, and, and I, you know, nine times out of 10, the one on the book tour is the criminal. Leon Panetta has, has his book coming out now, and he's gonna go on book tour while John Kiriakou, who blew the whistle on the waterboarding, is, is in prison. And, 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 and this is not just about going after a few lone whistleblowers. The reason that they are spying on journalists the reason they are collecting journalists' metadata, the reason they are seizing journalists' phone records is because they want to figure out who is giving journalists information that they don't want out in the public. You remember after the Osama bin Laden raid, John Brennan was like a sieve. He was leaking constantly, just details all the time about that raid. And a lot of it turned out to be false. He was telling us the thing about bin Laden throwing his wife in front of him. That turned out to be false. That bin Laden had a gun in his hand. That turned out to be false. That there was a fierce firefight. That turned out to be false. All of these, these details were leaked because they wanted it out. They wanted to set that narrative. But then when people start to actually tell other details about it, like one of the guys who was on the raid who wrote a book, then they launch a huge criminal probe. Then they send out all these messages saying, no one is allowed to speak to journalists in an un unauthorized capacity. What is the definition of state media? State media means that the state controls the dissemination of information about itself and its society. We are veering toward that with these policies. When the only information that can lawfully be reported is the information that government spokespeople or US officials decide to either leak or put out uh, in, in public, then we are heading toward a system where, where the line between state media and free media is almost non-existent in this country. Take that combined with the fact that those clowns that host the Sunday shows and the, and the pundits pretending to be journalists uh, on TV, they don't need anyone to tell them what to say or, or what to write in their columns or on these TV shows because it's so ingrained into their head. They have Empire Stockholm Syndrome. And, they, and they, they already know what they're supposed to say. You know, back in the days when the big media corporations were rising up, the Hearsts and others, there was actual conspiracy stuff going on where powerful fat white guys with cigars would meet with the powerful white, fat white guys with cigars and they would come up with how they're gonna sort of spin the narrative. That's unnecessary in, in today's day and age because these companies are so well trained that they know what they're supposed to say. And the, and the, the greatest sort of irony of all is that they don't even realize that they are unpaid spokespeople for the state. I mean, they're getting paid well by Fox or CNN or whoever, but they're not getting a check from the government for the work they're doing for the government. And, and, and we are living, I mean, Amy Goodman always says, and I've seen her say it for 12 straight years, that we are at an all-time low with, with uh, the state of our media. And the reason why I'm saying that is not to say, oh, Amy just uses this line all the time. It's because every time she says it, it's true because every year it gets worse and worse and worse. And at a time when we have this perpetual state of war, when President Obama is now embracing fully the neoconservative agenda that the world is a battlefield and that the US has a right to go anywhere where it can come up with any rationale that it's about fighting terrorism, 
the person who I think is most uh, joyful over the Obama presidency when it comes to his so-called counterterrorism policy is Dick Cheney. Because President Obama has been able to extend the power of the empire and continue policies that would have been confronted had John McCain won that election in 2008 or if Mitt Romney had won that election in 2012. Now, I don't want Mitt Romney to be president. I don't want Ted Cruz to be president. I don't want Jeb Bush to be president. But I also don't want a Democrat to be president and, and assuming they're going to get everyone's votes, if, if what their foreign policy amounts to is keeping alive the very kinds of policies that so many people on the left, including many mainstream Democrats, found so reprehensible when it was a Republican doing it. There is no Democrat or Republican cruise missile. The last thing I'll say, and then Amy and I can get into a conversation, uh, is um, when I was in, I spent a lot of time in Iraq in the 1990s, early 2000s, and um, uh, Tariq Aziz was, uh, uh, was one of the senior officials in Saddam Hussein's government. Um, and, and I had gotten to know him pretty well over the years. I would always interview him when I would go to Baghdad. And, um, and he always would sort of just try to get, you know, we would have a free-flowing conversation, then I would turn on my recorder, and then he would never say anything good. He would just sort of, you know, spout propaganda. Um, but he was an interesting, well-educated guy, and he understood the deal. He wasn't, you know, uh, stupid. And on the eve of the 2003 invasion, the last time I saw Tariq Aziz, we were in his residence, and um, he was in his pajamas when we were talking, and he had on these slippers, and he was smoking a cigar. And, um, and I said, you know, what, um, what do you think is going to happen when the Americans come in? And, and when we had talked in 1998, for instance, when Clinton was about to start bombing Iraq, he was saying, oh, you know, the, the Americans try to come into Iraq, we'll slaughter them at the gates. And this time he said, you know, um, the Americans can invade Iraq, they can, they can occupy Iraq for a while, um, they can kill Saddam Hussein, they can destroy the Ba'ath Party, um, but they will be opening a Pandora's box that they will never be able to close. And, and what he was talking about, um, you know, he was a Ba'athist, and the Ba'ath Party, of course, is a notoriously corrupt, atrocious sort of entity, but at the beginning and at its core, it had some sort of socialistic uh, vision about it. And it also was believed, whether it was lip service or real, probably depended on the individual person or country, in a sort of pan-Arab nationalism. And there was a fierce sort of secular tradition. And it's part of the reason why the United States liked Saddam Hussein, is that they viewed him as a, a strong man who could speak their language, didn't appear to be fanatical, and, uh, and so they, they backed him. They backed him from the time he took power in the 1950s. They backed him when he was uh, uh, using chemical weapons against his own people, as they're fond of saying. He was purchasing those weapons from the United States at the time. In fact, Reagan had Iraq removed from the list of state sponsors of terrorism in 1982 so that they could sell him weapons to use against Iran as part of Kissinger's let them kill each other off strategy. So when Saddam started to threaten any economic interests of, of, of the United States and its corporate friends, that's when Saddam became tantamount to Hitler. But it, it, what, they, what they were doing, what the US was doing by effectively supporting Saddam Hussein, and I, I would argue that they continued to support him even after 9-11 uh, and even after the, the Gulf War a decade earlier, um, because the, they, their policy of sanctions meant that the average Iraqi couldn't spend any time thinking about trying to change their government because they were spending all their time trying to figure out how to get food and medicine and keep their families alive. So US policy from, from the 50s to the present has been consistent in the sense that it's been consistently anti-Iraqi civilian. So they, they had Saddam Hussein and they loved that he was a strong man because he was keeping the Shia minority in Iraq in a cage basically and keeping Iran from expanding its sphere of influence. It was keeping some of the more um, radical elements among Sunni jihadist groups out of Iraq for the most part. In fact, the only Al-Qaeda presence in Iraq uh, prior to 9-11 was in the north of Iraq, a group called Ansar al-Islam, and they were in the area controlled by the US and its allies. And they were fighting against Saddam Hussein's regime because they considered him to be an apostate. None of this context is ever present when we talk about what ISIS is. Where did they come from? Is it, is it simply that, they are that this guy Baghdadi wants to establish the caliphate and he somehow managed to find legions of people that, are, that just want to run around beheading people and chopping off hands in public squares? No. 
there are some elements of ISIS that certainly embody that description. But my, my theory, and, and part of it is based on, on solid fact, is that a large core of, of, the, mostly, uh, of the, the military personnel within ISIS who actually understand how to use the tanks and the heavy weaponry are people that were among the 250,000 Iraqi soldiers fired by Paul Bremer when he came in to be the Viceroy of Iraq in 2003. There is a, the senior most uh, official from Saddam Hussein's regime, Izzat Ibrahim al-Takridi, is one of the top military commanders of ISIS. He was a secular Ba'athist who was a leading general in the Iran-Iraq war and all throughout Saddam's time in power. He uh, it was, a, it was a king on the deck of cards that the United States had put out, and he's the senior most person that they haven't captured yet. He's one of ISIS's military commanders now. I don't think he's interested in establishing the caliphate. I think he's interested in reclaiming the Sunni sections of Iraq that were taken when the United States came in. What I'm saying is that the United States is helping to create the very threat that it claims to be fighting. And, and we've seen this repeatedly under both President Bush and President Obama. In, in Yemen, Al-Qaeda in the Arabian Peninsula has grown stronger as a result of our drone policy. In, uh, in Somalia, uh, various radical elements, um, sometimes people talk about Al-Shabaab, but there are others, have been able to stage what they call spectacular attacks against the United Nations and the African Union, in part in response to the fact that the US was so, for so long backing CIA uh, warlords. Uh, in Somalia, but also conducting uh, drone bombings and on the ground targeted killing operations. President Obama has done covert operations in Mali leading up to, all of a sudden out of nowhere people started hearing about Mali. The United States had a covert campaign in Mali, has a, had a covert campaign in Libya. Uh, JSOC, the Joint Special Operations Command and the CIA were, were doing hunter killer missions inside of Libya leading up to the siege of the US consulate in Benghazi. It's the dirty secret no one wants to talk about because the Tea Party people and their carnival of, cra of crazy have made it so that we can't have an actual conversation about what happened at Benghazi. But part of what happened there, and we know this from insiders who were there at the time, is that John Brennan was running a covert killing campaign using elements of the US military and the CIA and the Benghazi assault had nothing to do with some Looney Bins movie about the Prophet Muhammad and everything to do with the fact that there was a low intensity covert war going on between US forces and rebel factions within Libya. Uh, but you don't read about that in the paper and, and it's a great favor to the White House that the Tea Party is as insane as it is. The scandal isn't that somehow Barack Obama you know, wanted, wanted the US consulate to be overrun and told this, the forces to stand down. The scandal is that his own administration was doing, was taking covert action there that resulted in blowback, that resulted in an American ambassador being killed. Uh, but we, we don't read about that in the paper because it's too difficult of a subject to discuss because people say, oh, you, you, you must want the Republicans to win if you're, if you're criticizing the Obama administration. You know, we heard it, it, it after 2008, what, do you want the Republicans to win in, in 2012? Now it's, do you want the Republicans to win in 2014? Then it's going to be in 2016. Well, what, what happens if Hillary Clinton comes into office and, 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 and can not only continues these policies, but expands them? When she was Secretary of State, she thought she was Secretary of Defense. She paramilitarized this, the State Department. She, she is far more hawkish in many of her policies than, than President Obama is. And Obama has been a very hawkish president. You know, it's boring to talk about the Republicans. It's boring to talk about Fox News. We all know who they are. We know where they stand. That, that's, you know, the only things that are going to live forever on the internet uh, and, and in the world are cockroaches and, and funny clips on media matters about you know, Republicans saying something stupid. We all know that. That's a boring discussion. Let's talk about what really matters. We have candidates in this country running and saying we're an alternative to them. And they are getting so many people's votes who, who oppose many of their policies. Unless we break the corporate control over our electoral process in this country, unless we break the two-party system in this country, we are never going to see substantial change. People ask all the time, well, what do you want to do about it? What should we do about it? What I always say to young people is, no matter what your issue is, what you're passionate about, the best thing you could be doing on that issue in this country is getting corporate money out of politics. Because whatever you care about can be best addressed when you don't have to pander to candidates who are already owned by the defense industry, by the pharmaceutical industry. Uh, look at what happens around immigration debates in this country. I mean, it's, it's so easy to purchase a, a congressperson when you have all that kind of money. 
But, but, but pe folks like this, I imagine there's not many wealthy people in this room. What, what do we have? Well, we have people power. We have our voices. We have our, our refusal to let them change our minds. You know, and, and, and I'll close by saying this. Yeah, I was a big, big admirer of, of Dorothy Day, the founder of the Catholic Worker Movement. And, um, and I'm a big admirer of Daniel Berrigan, the Jesuit uh, post, uh, poet, priest. Um, and when Dorothy Day uh, died, Daniel Berrigan eulogized her. And one of the things that he said during that eulogy um, was that Dorothy Day lived as though the truth were true. And, and I, 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 it's such a, a simple and beautiful concept. And I think it, it's, it's something that I always remember when I feel like we're fighting an unwin unwinnable battle. Because at the end of the day, what, what, what does matter? The truth matters. Justice matters. Uh, at the end of the day, what does it mean to have, to have lived on this planet? What, what, it, what it means is that you struggled on behalf of your fellow human beings to leave the world a better place than you found it when you came into it. And that's why I'm honored to receive this award. And I'm honored to be with all of you great folks from Peace Action. Thank you very much. Jeremy, thank you very much for accepting our award. Mm -hmm. So you see with us, we have Amy Goodman here. Thank you for being with us. Um, I know Amy needs no further ado, but let me uh, introduce Amy. It's my great pleasure. Uh, Amy Goodman is the co-founder, executive producer, and host of Democracy Now!, a national, daily, independent, and award-winning news program. <coughs> Uh, Amy is a longtime friend of Peace Action, and she is a true icon in the field of investigative journalism. So we thought that it would be a nice idea to have Amy and Jeremy chat, considering, as Jeremy explained, they've been through some things together. Um, but before they do, let me just say one more time, thank you very much for accepting our award. So I'll leave it to you guys. Thank you, Liz. Before um, we have a chat, I just wanted to say a few words about Jeremy. I met Jeremy at the end of 1997. Right. I was going over to the Catholic Worker to do a piece on a um, exhibit they were doing on Dorothy Day. And I walked into the hospitality house, the idea that there are homes around the country, uh, Dorothy Day established this, that invited in people who did not have homes um, to have a home and to have a warm place and to have warm meals. Jeremy lived there. Oh, well, I didn't know Jeremy at the time, but I walked in to do this piece and this young man came up to me and was in mid-sentence saying, you really do have to interview this guy. And I think the most important thing is that the man in the corner over there is someone that comes on Democracy Now! and actually has a discussion because he's really one of the most important journalists. And if you would, edit, and I said, excuse me, can you tell me your name? And so he said, well, no, his name is William Worthy. And uh, he's in the corner. He's extremely worthy. Uh, he went to North Vietnam. He went to Soviet Union. Um, he he had his passport taken by the United States government. He covered the Iranian Revolution, which is also very interesting. He was a journalist, uh, yeah. Yeah, he was a journalist. And um, uh, he said, so if you could please interview him. I said, but what is your name? And so finally Jeremy said, it's Jeremy, and I would like to work at Democracy Now!, but if you could just interview <laughs> Mr. William Worthy. <laughs> So um, we did interview William Worthy, and uh, he was a remarkable journalist. He only recently died. African-American, former assistant to the dean at Howard University. But before that, his journalism, this crusading journalism, whether it was in China or the Soviet Union or North Vietnam or in Cuba. And I thought it was interesting, Jeremy's w winning the William Sloan Coffin Prize and that um, uh, William Sloan Coffin quit the CIA over the Iranian Revolution, uh, where these two men converged because William Worthy uh, covered the Iranian Revolution, brought back uh, 
U.S. documents that were published publicly as books in Iran, but were not allowed into the United States that showed the U.S. complicity and the overthrow. I mean, the U.S. actually essentially overthrew um, the democratically elected um, government of Mohammad Mossadegh. Um, so that's how I met Jeremy. And he came to work at Democracy Now! And within a few months, we traveled together to Nigeria, Africa's most populous country. And <coughs> had this extraordinary experience of meeting Ken Sarawiwa's family. You know Ken Sarawiwa, who is the remarkable crusader in Nigeria, well-known writer, um, wrote the most famous soap opera in Nigeria, um, but decided to throw in his lot with the Agoni people, his own people. Uh, he was head of the Nigerian Writers Association because they were taking on Shell one of the most powerful corporations in the world, and they had crisscrossed their property in Agoni land with these above ground uh, pipelines. And they would flare off the gas, something that's illegal in the United States, although it is done in some places. It flare off the gas in apartment building size flares. The kids never knew a dark night in Agoni land and would breathe in the soot from this fire. And he came to the United States, and he came on WBAI. I was doing the morning show with Bernard White at the time, and we had a fully booked show. And an activist came and said, you got to meet this guy. I'd never heard of Ken Sir. We went. I said, I'm sorry, it's booked. But if you come back tomorrow, and they said, no, 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 we need to come today and be on the show, because he won't be here tomorrow. So I said, two minutes, and then we bumped over all the other guests as this remarkable man spoke, Ken Sarwi, and said, I'm a marked man, and when I go back to my country, I'll be arrested, because I've taken on the nexus of power between corporations and dictatorships. And um, he, was, uh, he went home, he was arrested, and he was executed, along with eight other uh, Goni rights activists on November 10, 1995. So Jeremy and I got a chance to go there. We visited Agoni Land, Ken's family, and um, worked on a documentary called Drilling and Killing, Chevron and Nigeria's Oil Dictatorship. Jeremy, uh, with that documentary, became, I think, the youngest winner of the George Polk Award, which is a very prestigious journalism prize, but it wasn't the only time Jeremy won. Uh, a few years later, um, Jeremy took on Blackwater. Blackwater, The Rise of the World's Most Powerful Mercenary Army, this astounding book where he changed the frame of how we view these private security firms, these mercenary companies. So to show you, um, because now we accept the problems with Blackwater, and you probably all did way back when Jeremy wrote the book, but uh, that was not the view of the mainstream media at all. I remember when Nisor Square happened, right? It was September 16th, 2007, right? Blackwater opens fire on innocent civilians in Nisor Square in Iraq and kills 17 of them. Blackwater guards are now on trial for this, and Jeremy was on Democracy Now! talking about it. Well, Jeremy's book had come out, and um, he told us this story. He told us, well, it was coming out, right? My, my book came out in, uh, in February of 2007, and then the Daily Show thing happened in April. So that's what I was going to talk about. So um, Jeremy's book comes out in the beginning of 2007. And Bef before Nisar Square, yeah. Before Nisar Square. And because the book came out, he was invited on The Daily Show, Jon Stewart. And you know, Jon Stewart's interviews are pretty much friendly. He usually interviews celebrities and uh, political figures. Um, so Jeremy came on the show with Blackwater, the rise of the world's most powerful mercenary army. And Jon Stewart was extremely hostile. And he said, what are you basically trying to prove with this book? These are patriotic men who, you know, whether you're a soldier or you work for a private security firm, firm, what is your point? Jerry did a very good job laying out the book. Uh, John Stewart was not pleased. Um, so let's fast forward now to Nisar Square. I remember the day Nisar Square happened, and CNN immediately had an expert on the show. It was a senior producer of CNN. Uh, she said she had information, um, she couldn't really reveal who it was, an inside source, that told her it is not what you think. 
right? She understood what was happening with Blackwater. She was speaking, speaking to people inside. It's not what you think. And Jeremy came on CNN and just blew that whole thing out of the water. So now Nisar Square happens, right? And a few weeks later, Chris Matthews of MSNBC comes out with his book, I think it was called Life's a Campaign. And he goes on Chris Matthews, and he goes on John Stewart. And John Stewart said, that's really pathetic if your life is like a campaign. And you know, he's sort of joking around with him, unlike anything he was doing, Jeremy. He was not joking around. You know, John the comic was not joking with Jeremy. But with Chris Matthews, he was jiving, and he was saying, it's pretty pathetic if your life is like a campaign. And anyway, the next day he came on the show, John Stewart, and said, all right, all right, all right, I got a lot of criticism from my interview with Chris yesterday, you know, everyone said this is the worst interview you ever did, all those people called me and said, how dare you, Chris said it was like the interview from hell and this is disgusting, and he said, all right, all right, all right, but that's not true, he said, it's not the worst interview I ever did, he said, the worst interview I ever did, and then they showed a clip of John and Jeremy because now all that Jeremy had said had come to pass. And you have John challenging him, what are you trying to prove, young man, with this book? These are patriotic Americans. And John said, that's the worst interview I ever did. Um, he said, it just goes to show that sometimes I don't know what the fuck I'm talking about. <laughs> 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 but then he did an ass kissing interview with Eric Prince recently when his book came out, the, the founder of Blackwater. So you know, it all comes full circle. It just shows you. I mean, Jeremy is a shatterer of, paradigm, of paradigms. He is, to say the least, ahead of his time. And he not only wrote Blackwater, The Rise of the World's Most Powerful Mercenary Army, but then he wrote Dirty Wars, The World is a Battlefield, and a uh, masterpiece where he goes to Yemen, he goes to Somalia, he goes to Afghanistan, exposing one story after another of US secret covert actions with the Joint Special Operations Command. And then um, his film, Dirty Wars, done with Rick Raleigh, is nominated for an Academy Award. And this is all before he turns 40 next week. Oh, that's, <laughs> whoa, 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 that's, so, um, wait, I, hold on. I have a response. To that. <laughs> All right. I am sitting next to the most fiercely private person on earth. <laughs> See, you all, everyone, like creepy guys will come up to Amy sometimes and say, I wake up next to you every morning. <laughs> but, but, no, because they, they're listening to her, you know, but whatever. Um, but, uh, I'll no, no, actually, I just went to the Naomi Klein, uh, uh, the See, Naomi Klein, Bill McKibben event, about and a guy came up to me and he said, I take a shower with you every single morning. <laughs> he has a shower radio. I said, I'm glad you're a very clean guy. <laughs> I, I could tell you the story about the, uh, the um, Nigerian king who had sent, he was the Oba of Benin, who uh, when word came that Amy had entered Benin in Nigeria, he sent some of his emissaries to offer her a marriage proposal. Um, <laughs> so, but that wasn't what I was gonna say. What I'm gonna say is that is, and I, I really appreciate you outing me on turning 40, Amy. Um, when, when I first started working with Amy, uh, the, uh, there was a New York Times reporter who was, was, was assigned to do a profile on Amy, and it was, for, it was like, for, what, what section was it? It was like a, it, uh, it definitely wasn't news, it was like It a, was the, um, it was like, not style, but Public like, life. Public life, right. So, Column. Right. So, so I, I would say, Amy and I just this, this, this little this little office, and I would just, you know, Amy was just like beside herself. She did not want the New York Times to do an article about her at all. And I would hear Amy all through the day, like, we have to, we're booking the show for tomorrow. And Amy was calling all of her friends and saying, under no circumstances do you tell them anything about me. And she's like, she, and she had everyone, like, and then, and then the, the, the reporter said, well, we always go to the person's house. It was the only time in the history of that column that they did not enter the person's house. She would, she's like, I don't even want them to know what neighborhood I live in. And it was like, it was, amazing just this fear and so I've, I've taken on uh, some of that m myself too I mean I'm very uh, vague about those things but now that you've uh, did you edit my Wikipedia <laughs> <laughs> but what I want to say is Jeremy said uh, he tries also to leave it lead a private life what he has taught all of us is it's very difficult to lead a private life 
I mean, Jeremy's work as co-founder of The Intercept, uh, and I hope everyone goes to theintercept.org to see his work, both in establishing, helping to establish this institution, uh, not to mention help to build Democracy Now!, but the pieces that he has done, these crusading pieces, um, exposing uh, you know, government control over our lives that breaks down barriers between conservatives and liberals. So many people are deeply concerned about corporate control. Um, but we have a few minutes, Jeremy. So if you could talk about what you think are the most critical issues. I mean, you have a very devoted audience here, dedicated in their own lives to making the world a better place. What you think are the critical issues um, uh, for people to mm. expend their energies on? Well, I think that, uh, you know, first of all, I'm sure many people in this room have already done this, but I, I, I believe that it should sort of be required annual viewing uh, to watch uh, Congresswoman um, Barbara Lee's speech that she gave on the floor of the U.S. Congress, Congresswoman from the Bay Area in California, uh, right after 9-11. And, uh, you know, there, there are very um, dedicated cynical people who will use a crisis to further a radical agenda. And we've seen that time and again with Katrina, Hurricane Katrina and others, uh, either disasters or um, you know, really tragic events. And Naomi Klein's book, The Shock Doctrine, lays all of that out. But Congresswoman Barbara Lee was the only member of Congress in either house to vote against the authorization for the use of military force. And the authorization for the use of military force, um, which, if I'm not mistaken, was, was 60 words long, uh, basically said that the United States reserved the right to pursue anyone connected in any way with 9-11. Uh, and, uh, and that could be a nation state or it could be an individual. And effectively, and this is, this is within a week of 9-11 happening, that Congress was asked to pass this. And uh, behind the scenes, Dick Cheney and Donald Rumsfeld and others knew exactly what they were doing. What they wanted was to receive a blank check that amounted to a coup d'etat in the executive branch of the US government. Uh, w w what I mean is that we have three branches of government. And at that moment, the executive branch assumed a dic dictatorship over American foreign policy and over the declaration of war powers uh, in, invested in Congress. Uh, Representative Barbara Lee rose to the floor that day and she was trembling um, because she knew that she was going to be the only member of the entire US Congress in either house that was going to vote against this at a moment when we were all told that we had to unite, that the country was one, there's no Democrat, Republican, there's no liberal or conservative, there's, we are all one. And uh, you know, I, I think of young people who, who've grown up with their entire life in the shadow of 9-11 of and how it, it, it's remarkable that what we're talking about happened in, in 2001 and here we are in, in 2014. A whole generation of kids have grown up, but I, I, I think it's so important for young people to watch it because that one member of Congress um, was the only person that got it right. The only person. At a time when everyone was saying, um, oh, no, 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 no. Even the most liberal lefty Democrats, um, they were saying, oh, no, we have to do this. We have to hunt them down. They did 9-11. We have to do this. And, and Barbara Lee said in that that it is a blank check for an unending state of war. And she was entirely right. She got death threats. Uh, she was harassed repeatedly. She was vilified. And she was vindicated by history. Because we are now at a moment when um, a man who ran for president and uh, on, on the idea that he was going to uh, change the way that the US conducted its business abroad and at home, uh, who has a remarkable personal story who energized a whole generation of young people into politics, and all of that is good. 
a lot of young people said, I, I care about politics because I support Barack Obama. And you can understand why so many people felt like, this is it, this is our moment, we have our candidate. And, 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 and what has happened since he's come into office on, on, on several key issues, particularly issues important to a lot of progressives in this country, is that he has enabled a continuation of, of, of a multi-decade policy that had devastating impacts on poor people in this country and around the world, uh, that has had a devastating impact on the cause of trying to end US militarism rather than expand it. And I think when the history books are written down the line, we are going to look back uh, and recognize these eight years as a, as, as a transformative moment in the history of the United States, but not in the way that everyone thought during that campaign in 2008. Transformative in the sense that it became the moment that this endless state of war, this power the US reserves to bomb any country where it perceives a threat, no matter how flimsy the evidence, becomes the way we will always do our business until the system that produces corporate Democrats and corporate Republicans is, is challenged. So the, the, the key issues right now, I mean, we, you know, people get stuck in, the, in the, the debate of the moment. What should we do about ISIS? But, oh, and then it becomes the Khorasan group. And what's the name now? I mean, it's, or have they come up with a new one? Because it's Brian Williams, when, when, they, when Khorasan group was announced, uh, had, it, it was, it's brilliant. You can look it up online and it's, it's there and I think it's like we should make posters of it. But it's Brian Williams, the anchor of NBC Nightly News, and it's, the phrase is next to it, the new enemy. And it just says the new enemy. It's like it could be a national holiday, although like a really awful macabre one, where we just roll out the, whatever the new enemy is going to be. It's not that ISIS isn't brutal and that there shouldn't be a, some sort of a response around the world to ISIS. It's that these things pop up and we're told that this represents this horrid existential threat to our existence. More people get killed by bee stings every year in this country than they do by acts of terrorism. And yet, you know, with the exception of Monsanto, no one is trying to kill all of the bees. Um, but so, you know, it's not that the United States doesn't have, uh, you know, it's not that nation states don't have a right to self-defense that's enshrined in international law. It's that we're not engaged in, a, in a, a, any kind of self-defense. Our wars are all offensive wars. This, the preemptive war doctrine, the authorization for the use of military force, and the idea of, of the world as a battlefield should be core issues that we're all looking at. And there are legislative components to it, um, and, but, but a lot of it has to do with public awareness and confronting these officials on their assertion that they actually have a right to bomb or conduct lethal operations in any country based on a flimsy bit of suspicion that someone maybe one day will engage in an imminent plot. Jeremy, can you talk about the man who has just been uh, appointed by uh, President Obama to train, or by the U.S. Syria. military, to train the, free, the uh, Syrian rebels? Yeah, I mean, I, I, I don't think if, if I didn't know who this was that it would have even raised anything with me, but the, last week it was, sort of, it was quietly announced that, uh, that this uh, special operations um, general, uh, Brigadier General Michael Nagata, was put in charge of training the, you know, the, the new freedom fighters in Syria that are going to fight the new bad guys, ISIS. And, um, and so he's deploying and is going to be organizing a campaign very similar to what the U.S. did in uh, Afghanistan when they, the goal was to expel the Soviet Union. So the U.S. is doing this you know, advise, assist, train, equip program. And the, the, this guy comes out of the tradition of General Stanley McChrystal and Admiral William McRaven, the elite commando units, and they definitely view the world as their battlefield. Um, the reason I know his name, though, is because in 2009, uh, for The Nation magazine, I did a story about the Joint Special Opera Operations Command, Blackwater, CIA operations inside of Pakistan. This is two years before the raid on Osama bin Laden's compound. I was reporting on actual raids that they were doing there and kill capture operations inside of Pakistan without the knowledge of the Pakistani government. And Cy Hirsch, uh, around the same time, did a report in the New Yorker about the Joint Special Operations Command's plans to seize Pakistan's nuclear weapons in the event of a coup or a change of power. And these were both, very, my story and Sai's story were both very big stories inside of Pakistan. The U.S. ambassador to Pakistan, Ann Patterson, denounced the stories, said that they were lies. Um, 
what I didn't know at the time, but found out some weeks after the story came out, and, and you saw the clip in the film of the Pentagon guy saying there's nothing to it, it's all conspiracy. He was talking about this story. Um, so uh, I, I get a call from a member of Congress, not an aide, but a member of Congress who's on the Intelligence Committee, and this congressperson told me that they had just received a classified report, I, I don't remember how many pages it was, it was, it was more than 20 pages, um, from the US Defense Attaché in Pakistan to the US intelligence committees saying that um, both Cy Hirsch and I had woven together innocuous bits of information to weave a fairy tale and that none of it is true at all. And they smeared us to Congress and, said, and actually accused us of inventing things. Um, well, when the WikiLeaks cables came out, uh, my story was entirely vindicated when uh, evidence of exactly what I said was happening there based on sources that I had inside the US military and on the ground, uh, the entire thing was true. But this guy had smeared us to uh, Congress, both Cy Hirsch and myself, and he's now the person who's in charge of uh, training, equipping, readying the, the new you know, force of freedom fighters in Syria. So how do you do the work that you do? I know we have to begin to wrap up soon. I start um, off every day by listening to Democracy Now. <laughs> I'm serious, I do. I really. Yeah, maybe, it's maybe not the first thing that I do, but let's just say that it's part of my daily routine as I always see what's on Democracy Now. Um, I can't stand to hear the opening music of Democracy Now because it, it gives me these terror tremors of when I would like, uh, you know, be having to run the, write, write the headlines and run around. It's like, a, it's, it's, it's like a trigger for me now. It's like a, some weird Pavlovian thing. I hear the Democracy Now thing and I'm like, okay, time to have a heart attack. Um, but I do, I do, now that it's uh, available in transcript form, it's much, it's much easier for my heart to take. Um, but I, I, I think that, um, um, I, I, admire, um, I admire the underdog, and I admire unsung heroes, and I, um, I have tremendous respect for, um, for people who have been dealt a really bad hand in life and rise above it. Um, and it's, it's activists that keep me going. It's whistleblowers that keep me going. Um, it's the fact that I think we actually do have wonderful, amazing people dedicating their life to peace and justice. And, and every time, I love going to the political conventions with you, Amy, the Republican and Democratic conventions, uh, in part because we go run around and confront the people who never will return our calls in power. And, and it's like the one time we got them all in the same place, like shooting fish in a barrel nonviolently. Um, uh, but, but because of what you see outside. And uh, the other day on your show, when I was on, you had Iraq veterans against the war. And, um, and there's so many amazing vets. Um, they're almost never allowed on television in this country. It's remarkable. And so many of them have deeply personal stories that are directly relevant to what's happening right now. So it's, it's a combination of people who dare to say no at a time of universal yes. It's, it's uh, people who served in the military and had an awakening and have dedicated their lives to peace. It's whistleblowers who are willing to face uh, charges under the Espionage Act and, and, and uh, so that the pe people can understand what's being done in their name behind closed doors and in secret. And it's, uh, it's the legacy of people like William Sloan Coffin and Dorothy Day and David Dellinger and William Worthy and uh, all the future leaders in the room tonight. So thank you. Well, Jeremy, congratulations on your well-deserved award. On behalf of <coughs> Peace Action New York State, uh, I just want to thank Jeremy Scahill for having the bravery and the audacity to go after the hard and difficult stories and to tell us and expose us the truth so we know, as we the people, what we should know and what we should do to ensure and act for peace. Uh, I'd like to thank Amy Goodman for being here. It's been our honor to have both of you here with us, truly. Uh, thank you all for coming. I encourage all of you to act for peace with us, uh, find your peace action.